We're going to be in Acts chapter 17 tonight for a few moments. Acts chapter 17. And they're looking at three verses this evening, uh, verses 10 through 12. Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through 12. And as our Awana program is beginning tonight, uh, I thought as our Awana program focused on the Word of God, that it would be good for you and I to focus on the Word of God as well this evening. So Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse number 10. Uh, once you found it, I ask if you would stand out of respect for the reading of God's Word. Uh, it will be on the screen there as well. Acts 10, uh, Acts 17, sorry, beginning in verse number 10, the Bible says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. Also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Tonight, I want to look at the Bereans, and I want to consider this thought, you and I being people of the book. Father, I pray that in these next few moments as we look into your word, Lord, that uh, you would give us an unusual attention to your word tonight. Father, I ask that you would give us an unusual sensitivity to your spirit tonight. And God, we would be ready both to hear and heed everything you have for us. Make us, I pray, more like Jesus, because we've been in your house this evening. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Church, the word of God will never fail. Amen. Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse number 18, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. The Word of God will never fail. The Word of God directs us. Psalm 119, 105, the Bible says, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Word of God protects us. Proverbs 30, in verse number 5, the Bible says, Every Word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. The Word of God sustains us. Psalm 119, 116. Uphold me, David said, according to thy word, that I may live and let me not be ashamed of my hope. The Word of God not only directs us, protects us, sustains us, it cleanses us. Psalm 119, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. The Word of God not only directs us and protects us and sustains us and cleanses us, the Word of God grows us. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 2. As newborn babes, look what he says, desire the sincere milk of the Word that ye may grow thereby. Church, the Word of God doesn't fail, amen? Not one jot, not one tittle. It directs us, protects us, sustains us, cleanses us, grows us, and equips us for life and ministry. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect. Truly furnished unto all good works. Church, the word of God will never fail. The word of God is settled forever. The word of God is alive and sharper than any two-edged sword. And tonight, I want us to remember again that we as Christians are called to be people of the book. If we claim to know the Lord... And we claim to love the Lord and we claim to follow the Lord, then it only makes sense that we know, love, and follow His Word. As a Christian, my identity, my instruction for living, my passions are not formed by self interest, they're not formed by political movements, they're formed by the Word of God. And since we're called to be people of the Lord, it makes sense that we be people of his word. Tonight, as our children begin to their dive into God's word, I think it's only fitting um, that we as adults are reminded that we should lead by example. Amen. 
and that we also need to be people of the book, knowing how to rightly divide the word of truth. So let's look at the Bereans tonight. They left us a pretty good example. Beginning in verse number 10, the Bible says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. If you back up, you'll see Paul and Silas experience great persecution and great opposition in the city of Thessalonica. And so the time came when they needed to get out of Dodge. And so the brethren got him out of Dodge, so to speak, and who, verse 10 says, coming thither uh, to Berea, went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, speaking of the Bereans, in verse 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. How so? And that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So what can we learn from the Bereans tonight? How can we apply their model or example? Number one tonight, I think it would be good for us to recognize their appetite for the word. As we look at the Bereans and we consider their example, I think it's good for us to recognize their appetite for God's word. Did you notice how the Bereans approached the Bible? The Bible says of them in verse 11 that they received the word with all readiness of mind. The word readiness means an eagerness. It's like a chomping at the bit. These guys were ready to rush forward. You ever seen a kid at Christmas? That's readiness. So my Emma had a birthday today. Now, Wednesdays are not great days to have birthdays, right? I mean, you got school, you got piano lessons, you you got church, and then then there's like, there's hardly any time for cake and ice cream. So what we did was we did her birthday party yesterday on Tuesday. But you know what she asked us? She said, Daddy, this uh, this was Sunday night. She said, Daddy, can I open my presents early on Monday? I said, no, you're already opening them early on Tuesday. She was ready. That's what the Bereans were. I mean, they saw this as a gift, and there was an eagerness, a readiness. I'm afraid sometimes we approach God's word more like a spelling test than a gift. (sighs) But these guys were eager to receive and understand the truth of God's word. And you see their approach, you see their appetite. The Bereans' readiness was was evidently made possible by the appetites they had developed. They had caught their heart to hunger for God's word. Now I want you to let that thought sink in. They had taught their heart to hunger for God's word. Now here's the thing about appetites. Appetites are developed. Appetites are developed. Let me explain. So good appetites are developed intentionally over time. You know, I drink one of them like green smoothie shakes every day and it looks like toxic sludge. Um, But at this point in my life, it's actually delicious. It's got spinach or kale in it. It's got banana in it. It's got some fruit in it, and it mixes it all up, and I drink it every day. Now, last week, I was out of town. You know what I didn't get? I didn't get my fruit and veggie shake every day. And to some of you, that's silly, but my body was like, dude, where's your fruit and veggie shake? And I wanted it. I didn't start there. I started like this. But I developed an appetite over time. If you've ever done exercise, if you've ever gone running, you don't wake up on day one wanting to run. Even less so on day two. (laughs) Even less so on day three. But somewhere around week fill in the blank, all of a sudden, if you're not moving, your body's going, hey, what are we doing? It's time to move. It's time to do it. Why? Because good appetites have to be intentionally developed over time. That's very different than the bad appetites. What what happens with the bad appetites? The bad appetites unintentionally develop as you drift after your base or fleshly desires. Meaning it's very easy for me, for my body to want sugar because that's where my body naturally wants to go. It's easy for me to to teach my body to come home and sit in the recliner. We got one of them couches that reclines. 
My body likes that. I got my spot. And the kids know they're in my spot when I walk in the room. Get out of my spot. Why? Boy, I like it. Now, spiritually speaking, it's the same way. You say, well, preacher, I just, I struggle to read God's word. I struggle to pray. I struggle to, to hunger after those things. Here's the thing. You have to intentionally teach your body to hunger after God's word. You have to intentionally develop the appetite for God's word. Now, I'm going to tell you, if you're a child of God, the spirit of God within you, he wants you to be in God's word. And he will move you to be in God's word. But I'm going to tell you, the, the actual act of, boy, something within me wants to, and me actually sitting down and opening up my Bible and doing it, sometimes are very different things. I'm going to tell you, church, one of the things we can learn from the Bereans is these people had taught their heart to hunger for God's word. They had intentionally over time developed that appetite. The Bible says the Bereans received the word received, it means intentionally took hold of, intentionally welcomed the word with all readiness, with all eagerness. Let me give you some applications here. Here's a thought. Church, we must intentionally guard and guide our heart to learn to welcome and want God's word. We must intentionally guard and guide our hearts to learn to welcome and want God's word. Because here's the thing. If we don't guard our hearts, guess what? We're going to find ourselves staring at a screen every spare moment we have. And then we don't have time for God's word. We're going to find ourselves here. We're going to find ourselves there. We have to guard and then we have to guide to both welcome and want it. I love how God describes his word. A couple of things that the Bible likens the word of God to. One of the things is, is, is bread. You know, man shall not live by every uh, bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Isn't it amazing that God likened his word to carbohydrates? Aren't carbohydrates wonderful? Amen and amen, especially when they come in donut form. I went to Bible assembly yesterday, and I had me a donut, and it was wonderful. So God likens his word to bread. Man, carbohydrates just feel good, don't they? God also likens his word to honey. It's sweet. Oh, it's sweet. God likens his word to gold and silver. A couple of verses, Job 23 and verse number 12. Job said, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. Look what he says. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Boy, that's a thought. Job said, if I had to choose between the word of God or breakfast, lunch, or dinner, I'm choosing the word of God. Psalm 119, 103, there the Bible says, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Psalm 119, 72, there the Bible says, The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Boy, we can identify with appetites for breads and sweets and golds. But what God wants us to learn is to develop an appetite for his word. Amen. So what can we learn from the Bereans about being people of the book? Well, first, we can learn and we can see and appreciate and adopt their appetite for God's word. I want you to see what else. Look at verse 11 again. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And what are those next four words, church? And searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So what can we learn from these guys? Number one, we can learn from their appetite for God's word. Number two, we can learn from their analysis of God's word. So these guys, they didn't just hunger for God's word. They analyzed it. They studied it. 
It's a matter of analysis. The Bereans, the Bible says, searched the scriptures. The word searched means to examine, to investigate, to scrutinize. Now, I want you to think about this. If you think Bible study today is hard, where we all have our own Bibles and we have computer programs and Google search functions and Strong's concordances and commentaries galore, if you think you have it hard, think about that. The Bereans had no personal Bibles. And so they would all come together every day to the synagogue to do what? To search the scriptures. It took time. It took effort. No computer programs, no Google search. But regardless of the time and effort, the Bereans determined to dig until they covered, uncovered the truth. They refused to settle for anything less than what was true and what was right. By the way, church, we don't mind digging into what we really enjoy. Some of you know an awful lot about hunting and fishing. You know how to track them. You know how to kill them. You know how to skin them. You know how to cook them. You know how to eat them. I know how to eat them. Um, that's, That's the one part of that process I can do. I can eat them. But some of us, man, we know an awful lot about hunting and fishing. Can I challenge you? If you're capable of learning that, you're capable of learning this. Some of us know an awful lot about cars. Years, makes, models, parts, prices, expenses, colors. Some of us, man, cars, cars are our thing. Or motorcycles. I'll throw that in there for the rest of you men. <laughs> yep, Jack, see, we got it. But I want to challenge you, men. If you can learn all that stuff about cars and motorcycles, you can learn this book. Some of you know a whole lot about health and fitness, some of you know a whole lot about finance, some of you know a lot about gardening. Shopping. Now we're picking on the ladies. Got that coupon thing down. You know tech. You know the difference between solid state hard drives and whatever else is not a solid state hard drive and RAM and gigabytes and megabytes and you can program and this and that and the other. I, look, if you can dig into that, you can dig into this. It's not that we can't study. I think a lot of times is that we have not learned to study God's word. And so we find the matter of analysis that the Bereans searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. They wouldn't give up. They wouldn't give in. They were going to analyze and examine and investigate and scrutinize until they uncovered what was true and what was right. Why was this matter of analysis so important? Because really, it's not so much a matter of analysis as it is a matter of authority. Think of this. Who was it that was preaching to them? It was the Apostle Paul. If the Apostle Paul walked into the Harvest Baptist Temple, I would sit down. I would sit down not there, but there. And I would listen to what the Apostle Paul had to say. But here's what the Bereans did. They listened to what the Apostle Paul had to say, and then they picked up this book to see if it was true. They fact-checked the man. Why? Because the Apostle Paul isn't the final authority. There's no preacher that's the final authority. This book is our final authority. And so why is the matter of analysis so important? Because the word of God is our final authority for faith and practice. Let me give you a couple others that it's not. These are not the final authority for faith and practice. Number one, it's not the preacher. If the preacher goes against the Bible, you get rid of the preacher. Number two, it's not your feelings. It doesn't really matter how you feel. If your feelings go against the Bible, you need to put your feelings aside. It's not the preacher. 
It's not your feelings. It's not tradition. It's not, it's not your tradition or my tradition. It's not our heritage. It's not our culture. It's not our comfort or convenience. It's not our political party. None of that, ladies and gentlemen, is our final authority for faith and practice. This is our final authority for faith and practice. And if this is our final authority, then we better take the time to make sure we know what it says. Jesus said in John chapter 5 and verse 39, he said, search the scriptures. I mean, Jesus could have looked at him and just said, hey, throw everything else out and listen to me. That's what Jesus could have said, because he is the word. And Jesus told those Jews there that day, he said, search the scriptures. He said, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they, the scriptures, are they which testify of me. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul admonished Timothy to study to show himself approved unto God, a workman that he needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And the beautiful thing is, these Bereans were willing to surrender themselves not to the apostle Paul, not to the arguments of man. They were willing to surrender themselves to the ultimate truth of God's word. We can learn from their analysis of God's word. Let me give you some applications here. This is really important. Uh, I want you to understand this. When I come to God's word and I want to analyze God's word, what am I, what am I looking for? What am I asking? What I, need to, uh, what I need to ascertain, what I need to learn, what I need to analyze, what I need to investigate is what did God mean when he said it? What did God mean when he breathed it out? When the Holy Spirit of God moved men to pen the very words of God. What did God mean when he said it? You know what I don't ever ask? What does this mean to me? No offense, it doesn't really matter. What we want is not what it speaks to me, but what did God mean when he said it? That church is where we have to start. Not what does it mean to me, but what did God mean when he said it? So how do we do that? Well, we study the Bible literally. God meant what he said, amen? We study the Bible grammatically. We, we study the, the history around it. We study the context. But we learn to study God's word, to ascertain, to analyze, to see what God meant when he spoke. By the way, if you don't understand, you know what you do? Well, you go, oh, well, and you close it and move on, right? No, ask questions. Ask questions. Get on the Harvest app. Email one of us. Text one of us. Come into the office and talk. And we can, we can analyze God's word together. You know what I think would be an awesome class for us to have at some point? How to study God's word. Taking, taking 12, 15 weeks and, and looking at how do we actually do this thing of studying God's word. Maybe we'll do that sometime. Now that I've said it out loud, we probably have to. <laughs> Ask questions. Here's the thing. Sometimes we're going to find I have the same questions you do. <laughs> but that's okay. Because we're students of God's word together. But we are learning to analyze God's word, to get to the truth, to get to what is real, to get to what is right. And by the way, when I study God's word, not only do I need to come to it trying to ascertain what did God mean when he said it, I need to come to God's word with a humble heart. Because very often I come to God's word with, with what I already know it means. Or, or I come to God's word, and God's word speaks, but I'm not willing to listen to it. And so when I come to God's word, I need to come to God's word with a humble heart. Learn to analyze, to, to draw out, to ascertain what God meant when he spoke it. Ask questions. Come with a humble heart. What can we learn from the Bereans about pe being people of the book? Church, number one, we learn about what? We learn about their, number one, their... Appetite. Let's say it again. Number one, their appetite. Number two, we can learn what? From their analysis. So we see their appetite. We see their analysis. Look at verses 11 and 12, and we'll be done. The Bible says this. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. and They received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore, 
Many of them believed. Also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. We see their appetite. We see their analysis. Finally tonight, we see their application. I want to point out something here about their application of God's word. First, their consistency. The Bible says that the Bereans were searching God's word daily. Christian, I love you, and you need to know that being in the word of God personally every day will do something for you that weekly church never can. I believe in the assembling of the body. I believe in weekly church. I believe in us coming out from the world and coming together. But the reality is you learning to get into God's word every day for yourself will do something for you that weekly church never can. Regularity in in hearing God's word and analyzing God's word and applying God's word to our lives, hiding God's word in our heart, develops spiritual health and strength. We talked about it earlier with developing the appetites and the habits. We all recognize the reality that regular good nutrition and regular physical exercise benefit the body a great deal. That over time, as you develop these things on a regular basis, boy, it does you a ton of good. What doesn't do you a ton of good, if on Sunday, all you eat are fruits and veggies, and maybe one small piece of lean meat, and you keep the calories down, and you're super healthy on Sunday, but then Monday, you eat a whole pepperoni pizza by yourself. Can I tell you, that don't work out real well. What do we need to do physically and spiritually? Learn to daily, daily, daily get what we need. And spiritually, that means daily we learn to be in God's word. I'll tell you something about both hunger and ability. Activity, regular activity brings ability and maturity. Regular activity brings ability and maturity. As you do it, you develop. As you do it, you become more confident and skilled in it. And so, church, have patience. But I love the Bereans and their consistency, how they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. But we not only see their consistency, we, we also see their change. Verse 12 starts with what word? Therefore. Now, students of the word... What do we do when we see the word therefore? What do we do? We have to go back, right? We have to go back and find out what the therefore is therefore. So we see therefore many of them believed. So what was it that brought the change into their life? Verse 11. How they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily. You see, having an appetite for God's word is a wonderful place to start. Learning to analyze God's word, to scrutinize and investigate and draw out the truth is is a wonderful way to continue. But boy, that appetite and that analysis, you know where it needs to end up? With a changed heart. That leads to a changed life. Being in the word of God personally every day accomplishes change in the hearts and lives of the hearers. Because they were in the word, therefore many believed. Their hearts were opened and their eyes were opened and therefore their lives were changed. And church, praise God that God's word rightly applied will change your life. Romans 10, 17, so therefore faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Isaiah 55 and verse 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I have sent it. John 17, verse 17, Jesus said as he prayed to the Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word 
is truth. Amen. And so we open our hearts. And then as we study, we ask God to open our eyes. And then the word of God will change our lives forever. Let me give you some application here. So in point number two, we talked about in our analysis, what are we looking for? We're looking for what God meant when he said it. So once I understand what God meant, then I have to ask the question, based on what God meant when he said it, not what does this mean to me, but what does this mean for me? Because God said it, what does this mean for me? How does my life change based on my understanding of God's word? You see, church, when we study the scripture, we look for the one interpretation, but we understand that there can be many applications. But you get better make sure you get the right interpretation. That's what God said, meant when he said it. Based on what God meant, what does that mean for me? Church, I think it's also what's understanding that God's word is not a textbook and it's not a reference book. God's word is a living book that cuts to the very core of our being. And because that's the case, we ought to pray for its impact. I love what the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 18. The psalmist prayed, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. We see their appetite. We see their analysis. We see their application. God's word does not fail. It will not fail. It cannot fail. Let me ask us, though, church, are we people of the book? How's our appetite for God's word? Oh, we have an appetite for a lot of things. We have an appetite for sports, and we have an appetite for hobbies, and we have an appetite for food, and we have an appetite for the phone, and we have an appetite for TV and that show or that movie. We have an appetite for a lot of things, but how's your appetite for God's word? (coughs) You know, maybe tonight we recognize, you know, my heart really doesn't hunger after God's word like it should. What should I do? I think, first of all, you should ask God to help you hunger after God's word. And then I think beyond asking God to help you hunger, you need to intentionally guard and guide your heart to intentionally develop those good spiritual appetites. How's our appetite tonight? Let me ask you, how's your analysis? How's your study of God's word? Ask questions. You say, well, preacher, I don't really know where to start. Seek assistance. How's your analysis? Finally tonight, how's your application? Let me ask you, how has God's word changed your life recently? What can we point to and say, because God's word says my life has been changed, I'm going to tell you, it is a living book. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. The Bible says piercing even the dividing of sunder of soul and of spirit. This is a penetrating, powerful book. How has it changed your life recently? How has it changed the way you think, changed the way you act, changed the way you're a spouse, changed the way you're a parent, changed the way you're a neighbor, changed the way you're a church member, changed the way you're a friend, changed the way you're a student, changed how you handle your money, changed how you handle your gifts, changed how you handle your time? How has this book changed your life recently? You know, so often I think, well, we want this big move of God. And sometimes God is really just speaking in that still small voice day by day. And he wants to change us moment by moment into the image of Christ. How has God's word changed your life recently? I think the danger for some of us is this. We're real good at holding God's word in our head while hiding it from our heart. It seems elementary. 
But I want this place and I want my heart to never get beyond that old song, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E.